So I'm not opposed to proprietary software. I'm actually not an open source zealot. I love open source for the what it brings, but I also see the role for proprietary software. But what I didn't like was the fact that I would develop code and publish it and then effectively telling somebody here to run my code, you have to have this proprietary software. Right, and there's also culture around MATLAB as much, because I've talked to a few folks at uh, MathWorks, great MATLAB. Math, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, there's, there's just a culture, they try really hard, but it's just, there's this corporate IBM style culture that's yes. like, or yes. whatever, I don't don't want to say negative things about IBM or whatever, but there's a... There's a no, it's, it's, it's really that connection. It's something I'm in the middle of right now is, is the business of open source and how do you right. connect the, right. the ethos of cooperative development with the necessity of, of creating profits, right. right? And like right now today, you know, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still in the middle of that. That's actually the early days uh, of, of me exploring this question. Because uh, I was writing sci-fi, I mean, as an aside, I also had, so I had three kids at the time. I have six kids now. Yeah. I got married early, wanted a family, uh, I had three kids, and I remember reading. I remember, read Richard Stallman's post, and I was I was a fan of Stallman. I would read his work. I liked this collective ideas he would have. Certainly, the ideas on IP law. I read a lot of his stuff. But then he said, you know, okay, well, I'm like, well, how do I make money with this? How do I make a living? How do I pay for my kids? All this stuff was in my mind. Young graduate student making no money, thinking I got to get a job. And he said, well, you know, I think just be like me and don't have kids. Right. That's just don't don't. That's his take on this. That's that was his. Ta- that was that was the what he, what he said in that moment. Right. That's yeah. the thing I read, and I went, okay, this is a train I can't get on. Yeah. <laughs> there has to be a way to preserve the culture of open source and still be able to make sufficient money to feed your. Yes, kids. exactly. Right. There's got to be. Well, so that actually led me to a study of economics, because at the time I was ignorant, and I really was. And I'm actually, I'm embarrassed for educational system that they could let me. And I was valedictorian in my high school class, and I did super well in college, and like I, academically, I did great, Mm -hmm. right? But the fact that I could do that and then be clueless about this key part of life, it led me to go, there's a problem. Like I should have learned this in fifth grade. I should learn this in eighth grade. Like everybody should come out with a basic knowledge of economics. You're an interesting example because you've created tools that uh, change the lives of probably millions of people. And the fact that you don't understand at the time of the creation of those tools, the basics economics of how yeah. like to build up a giant system is a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's a problem. And so I, during my PhD at the same time, this is back in 98, 99 at the same time, I was in a library, I was reading books on capitalism, I was reading books on Marxism, I was reading books on, you know, what is this thing? What, what, is it, what does it mean? Yeah. And I encountered, a, I, I basically what I, I encountered a, a set of writings from people that said they were the inheritors of Adam Smith. Mm-hmm. Read Adam Smith for the first time, right? Which is the wealth of nations and kind of this notion of emergent, emergent uh, societies and realized, oh, there's this whole world out here of mm-hmm. people. And, and the challenge of economics is it's also political. Like, because economics, you know, people, different parties running for office, they'll that they, they want their economic friends. Mm-hmm. They want their economists to back them up, right? Or to to be their to be their magicians, like the magicians in Pharaoh's court, right? The people that are gonna say, hey, this is you should listen to me because I've got the expert who says this. Mm-hmm. And so it, it gets really muddled, right? Uh, but I was looking at it from a as a sci- as a scientist going, what is this space? What does this mean? How do people how does Paris get fed? How does how do, what is money? How does it work? Mm-hmm. And I found a lot of writings that I really loved. I found some things that I really loved. And I learned from that. It, it was writings from people like Von Misses. He wrote a, he wrote a paper in 1920 that still should be read more than it is. It was, got, and the, it was the economic calculation problem of the socialist commonwealth. It was basically in response to the Bolshevik revolution in 1917. And his basic argument was, it's not going to work to not have private property. You're not going to be able to come up with prices. The bureaucrats aren't going to be able to determine how to allocate resources without a price system. And a price system emerges from people making trades. Mm -hmm. And they can only make trades if they have authority over the thing they're trading. And that that, that creates information flow that you just don't have Mm -hmm. if you try to top down it. Right. Right. It's like, huh. That's a really good point. (laughs) Yeah, the price is to have a signal that's used. And it's, it's important to have that signal when you're trying to build a community of productive people yeah. like you would in the software engineering space. Yeah, the prices are actually an important signaling mechanism, Yeah, right? And that money is just a bartering tool, yeah. right? So this is the first time I've encountered any of this concept, right? And the fact that, oh, this is actually really critical. Like it's so critical to our prosperity and that I, we're, we're dangerously not learning about this, not teaching our children about this. 
you know. So you had the three kids, and you had to make some. Hard I had to make decisions. some money, right? I had to figure, figure it out, but I didn't really care. I mean, I, I was never. I've never been driven by money. Just need it. Yeah, right. right. You need um, to eat. So what? How did that resolve itself in terms of side by? So I would say it didn't really resolve itself. It sort of started a journey that I'm continuing on. <laughs> I'm still on. I would say I don't think it resolved itself, but I will say, I I went in wide eyes wide open. Like I knew that there were problems with, you know, um, giving stuff away and creating uh, the the, ex the market in externalities that the fact that, yeah, people might use it and I might not get paid for it and I'll have to figure something else out to get paid. Like at least I can say I, I'm not bitter that a lot of people have used stuff that I've written and I haven't necessarily benefited economically from it. Like yeah. I've heard other people be you know bitter about that when they write or they talk like, oh, I should have got more value out of this. And I'm also, I want to create systems that let people like me, who might have these desires to do things, let them benefit. So it actually creates more of the same. Not to turn on your bitterness module, but there's some aspect, I wish there was mechanisms for me to reward whoever created SciPy and NumPy, because yeah. it brought so much joy to my life. I, I appreciate that. And you I, know what I mean? The tip dark notion was there. I appreciate that. And I think- But there should be a, a very there frictionless should be mechanism. There frictionless mechanism. I totally agree. I would love to talk about some of the ideas I have, because I actually came across, I think I've come up with some interesting notions that could work, but they'll require, you know, anything that will work takes time to emerge, right? right? Like things don't just turn overnight. That's definitely one thing I've also understood and learned is any fixes, that's why it's kind of funny, we often give credit to, you know, oh, this president gets elected, and oh, look how great things have done. And, yeah. and I saw that when when I had a, a transition at uh, in a condo, when a new CEO came in, right? And it's like the success that's happening, it, there's an inertia there. Yeah, right. and sometimes the decision you made like 10 years before is the reason why the success is <laughs> right. see. Right, exactly, uh, no. so we're, we're, we're sort of just going around taking credit for stuff. Yeah, the credit like, assignment has like a delay to it yes. that, that is makes the credit assignment basically wrong more than right. More, wrong more than right, exactly. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, this is, you know, that's the stuff I would, I would I would read a ton about, you know, early on. So I don't, I feel like I, I'm with you. Like I want the same thing. I want to be able to, and honestly not for personally, I've been happy. I've been, I've been happy. I feel like I don't have any, I mean, we've been done reasonably okay, mm -hmm. but I've had to pursue it. Like that's, that's really what started my um, trajectory from academia is reading that stuff led me to say, oh, entrepreneurship matters. Mm -hmm. So I love software, but, entre but we need more entrepreneurs and I want to understand that better. So once I kind of had that that virus infect my brain. It I, even though I was on a trajectory to go to a tenure track position at a university, and I was there for six years, I was kind of already out the door when I started.